Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming tonight, you brave souls. I know it's still raining in several different areas of Central Florida, so uh, welcome to tonight's topic. Uh, you know, it's interesting that a lot of times the message that we open, which, mind you, we, we open at random, uh, but it's always interesting to see that the message that we open typically has something that's directly related to the topic, uh, and, and that happens pretty often. In fact, even at home, when we do the gospel at home, we will usually read a, a little book similar to Happy Life before we start reading uh, in the gospel. And sure enough, there are several times where we open it up and it's almost as if we you know, spent a few minutes trying to go through and, and, and grab a message that was matching one or the other. Um, but anyway, so tonight's topic, uh, we're going to be talking about success. Um, and of course, we will talk a little bit about work, which was what the message, uh, the short message of tonight was. Uh, but we'll be talking about success and a little bit of the material view and what the spiritism view around success is. Um, so that's why we're on there. We have temporary or eternal, right? And that's what we're going to be talking about, some of the differences between the two. So I think the one thing that we can agree on when it comes to success is the fact that people will always define it differently. Every single person that you may talk to may have a different definition or a different perception as to how they measure success or how what they consider a successful person to be. Um, so we'll start off by just you know a, a general definition of what people here will typically define success as. So if we pull up a definition from Webster's Dictionary, right? So a pretty, pretty famous, pretty, pretty uh, knowledgeable resource. We find that it's a degree or measure of succeeding and furthermore favorable or desirable outcome. Also the attainment of wealth, favor, or eminence. On dictionary.com, we find something very similar. The favorable or prosperous termination of attempts or endeavors the accomplishment of one's goals, which I think that, that might be the definition that we most align with, right? And then, but then of course, on the bottom, there is a piece that, again, the attainment of wealth, position, honors, or anything like it. And Oxford Dictionary gives us a definition of success as it being the attainment of fame, wealth, or social status. Right? So here on earth, whenever we think of a successful person or a successful business, anything of that sort, we usually translate that to some sort of social status or somebody who is really famous, very well known, the best in their position or somebody that has a lot of money. And so when we think about that, let's look at what we would consider to be somebody who is a very successful person, right? So we look... At Bill Gates, right, so the co-founder uh, and founder of Microsoft, so one of the wealthiest people in the world with a net worth of 86 billion, potentially even more now. But to him, success is about relationships and leaving behind a legacy, right? So at no point does Bill Gates talk about the amount of money that he has or, you know, the position that he has and how he outranks certain people or how he... He owns and, and was the founder of one of the most successful business out there. No, what he said was, it is nice to feel like you made a difference. Inventing something or raising kids or helping people in need. So even when it comes to what he could call one of his biggest creations in life, he translates that to now his ability to be able to help others or leave behind a legacy that will make sure that other people continue on, continue on with the work that he has been doing, right? So looking at that, it, it changes a little bit that definition that we saw earlier because at no point does he talk about the amount of money that he has, the rank that he has. So where is, where is that disconnect? Now, when we talk about divine success, right, so the opposite of material success, I think when, with the knowledge that we have here in this room and some of the things that we've learned along the way, when we think about success, 
we think about it a little bit differently because we know that the material successes that we have here on earth really truly only matter in the time that we have here. However, if we think of that eternal, that long-term success, we ourselves here in this room might define it as overcoming oneself, right? Finding inner peace, love and charity, the people that we have closest to us. So it, it's interesting when we compare these two different definitions, we then ask ourselves, well, why is there such a big disconnect between those two, those two definitions and, and that perception that people have that success is all about having money, having the best job, having the best car. And so it's important that we consider why people think about material success the way they do and why we think about divine success based on the laws that we have and the knowledge that we have. So if we go to compare, we can look at question 617 in the Spirits' book, and, the spirits, uh, and Kardec asks the Spirits, what do the divine laws encompass? Do they apply to anything other than moral conduct? And the Spirits answered, all the laws of nature are divine because God is the author of all things. Scientists study the laws of matter, whereas moral individuals study and practice the laws of the soul. And I love that phrase because we talk about scientists, but it's not really just scientists. It's all of us here on earth. Anything that, that we study, anything you know, that, that we kind of put together, we're, we're talking about solely in, in the laws of matter. When in reality, for these people that are exemplifying these moral laws, they're really studying the laws of the soul. They're thinking about eternity and not just necessarily that temporary success. And so a follow-up question was, do humans have the ability to master both the laws of nature and the laws of matter? So do we have the ability of taking the knowledge that we have right now about the laws of matter and how as humans we think that the world should be run, and can we kind of bridge that gap to match the laws of nature? And the answer was quite simple, yes, however, a single existence is not enough, right? We cannot, we cannot possibly learn everything that, that, that we have to learn and to evolve and to become a pure spirit in just one existence. That'd be really nice, but it, it's gonna take a few hundred, perhaps thousand, until we get there. So if we consider only the distance separating the primitive from the civilized individual, what indeed are a few years of acquiring everything that comprises a, perfect, a perfected being? The longest life possible is insufficient, and all the more so when it is cut short, as happens with a large number of people. Among the divine laws, some regulate the movement and workings of inert matter. These are the physical laws, and studying them belongs to the domain of science. Others specifically concern humans and their relations with God and their fellow beings encompassing the rules of the life of the body and the soul. These are the moral laws. So the moral laws, which we'll go into a couple of the laws in here, but the moral laws were the laws being put together by, by God, right? Shared uh, through the spirit, shared through Jesus' teachings, but those were that's what we'll call the divine laws. So... Has God provided all humans to the means of knowing his laws? All may know about it, but not all understand it. Moral persons and those who desire to examine it are the ones who understand it best. Nevertheless, all will understand it someday because progress must be made. So we may not necessarily be aware of all of those laws and have the understanding. However, it is available to us. Right? It, it solely depends on us to be able to, to, under, to seek to understand and to be able to study and practice it on a daily basis. So although we may not all be there, it's certainly available to all of us. In addition to that, the justice of multiple human incarnation springs from this principle because in each new existence, human's intelligence becomes more developed and they better comprehend what is good and what is evil. If everything had to be accomplished in a single existence, what would be the fate of the many millions who die every day in the brutishness of the primitive state or in the darkness of ignorance simply because they were born into a situation that did not enable them to become enlightened? 
So if we ever question ourselves as to why we need that many lives or as to why people are in one stage and somebody else is in a, in a different stage in, in their development and their evolvement, this is, this is the, the true definition of God's endless love for us, that we have that many opportunities and that many reincarnations to be able to get the point where we can understand what his plans are for each and every one of us. So one of, uh, one of the natural laws is the law of equality, because I think when we talk about success, it raises a lot of questions as to why some people are really successful, and if that's the case, if, if God were really you know, somebody who's fair, how is it that we have somebody who is so successful while others barely have anything to eat? And so this is the law that we can look back to to be able to understand why some of the differences that, that are out there, and even perhaps as to why, as humans, we, we place success on material things. So in the law of equality, in question 803, it asks, are all people equal before God? Yes. Right? And I think we can all agree on that. And the answer is absolutely, yes. All are headed towards the same goal. God has made the divine laws for everybody. You often say the sun shines the same on everyone and you thereby state a greater and more general truth than you might think. So knowing that we have those multiple lives and understanding that we all each evolve at our own pace, we then can understand that the definition that as society gives to success is truly just a definition of material success because in reality, we are all going to attain that eternal success, but it just depends on us. But we are created equal and given the same resources, the same aptitude to get there, but it depends on us how much time that takes. In addition to that, they added, all are subject to the same laws of nature. All are born with the same fragility. All are subject to the same sufferings. The bodies of the rich decompose like the bodies of the poor. Therefore, God has not granted natural superiority to anyone either by birth or by death. All are equal before God. And I think this part where it talks about that the bodies of the rich decompose like the bodies of the poor is probably one of my favorite parts. Uh, and I'm sure that there have been times where, you know, when people talk about equality and things like that, we've all seen the picture where uh, it'll show multiple coffins and you can't tell what religion that person had, what status they had, what social ranking they had, or what they believed in, because at the end of the day, the success should be measured by who we are as, as individuals, and what, what our process, and which way in our evolution, and what we're doing to support other people, to love each other, to, to practice charity. Because at the end of the day, we, we are truly all equal. This is probably one of my favorite phrases um, because it says, when one door closes, another door opens. But we so often look so long and so regretfully upon the closed door that we do not see the ones which open for us. Right? And it's very true, and I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have experienced this where we were so adamant and so stubborn, which we all are, I'm sorry to break it to everybody, so am I, and I'm including myself in there, um, but we are so adamant and we are so, just so set in our ways and thinking that we know exactly what we want and we know exactly what's best for us and I'm gonna do everything possible that I can to, to, to get to this point and the second that doesn't work out, we go, there's no way. No, 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 this is what I want, this is what I'm gonna do. And then there are times where we even ask for a sign, God gives us a sign saying, that's not the door you should be looking at, it's the other one. And we go, was that really a sign? No, I don't think so, I'm gonna continue knocking on that same door. And oftentimes we don't, we don't see those blessings in disguise because we get so focused in our little world and thinking that we know what's best for us and I know exactly what I want, what I need, that we don't see. And so we, we keep pulling on that door that has been shut when there is a realm of opportunities that are out there for us because we just don't look. 
And we forget that at the end of the day, we don't even know what we want for ourselves. We may have an idea, right? And even what we think we want usually isn't even what's best for us, right? And so if we think just about putting all of those ma material things, those thoughts, that anxiety, that, that, that frustration that we have in God's hands and asking him to help us do and find what's best for us, then we leave ourselves open to whatever doors end up, you know, becoming available or opening because we stop focusing on the door that's been closed. So when we talk about success and what success here on earth look, looks like and how we can measure it, we usually look at a lot of people that were really famous or very well known and a lot of times we may not necessarily know their story but we just go, wow, that person, so successful. I'm sure they were born, you know, super successful already and we don't realize the amount of times and tries that they had and they failed at, learn from those mistakes to then become really successful people, right? So we look at Albert Einstein, who did not speak until he was four and did not read until he was seven, causing his teachers and parents to think he was mentally handicapped. Slow and antisocial, he eventually won the Nobel Prize and changed the face of modern physics. So at that time, right, had he had him not been somebody as persistent and continued to work through the failures and the trials, we wouldn't have had all of that success. We wouldn't have had the breakthroughs in physics that we did because of him. We look at Walt Disney. Walt Disney was fired by a newspaper editor because he lacked imagination and had no good ideas. I wish I had no good ideas like that. After that, Disney started a number of businesses that didn't last too long and ended with bankruptcy and failure. He kept plugging along, however, and eventually found a recipe for success that worked. So imagine here, if he had just looked at that door of that newspaper editor who said, you're not cut for this, you're not good enough, and he had just kept trying the exact same thing, we probably wouldn't have the, the success that, that we have out today, right? We cannot expect to do the exact same thing and get different results. If something is not working, we need to acknowledge that. It is okay to fail. We learn from our failures, we learn from our mistakes. But it's important that when we do fail and we do make a mistake, that we acknowledge and that we're okay with that. Because if we're not, if we can't be okay with ourselves failing and we can't learn from that and we just put our faces down, that's the end of it, right? But imagine how many failures it takes to then get it just right. So we look at Isaac Newton. He never did good at school. Can you imagine? He never did good at school. And when put in charge of running the family farm, he failed miserably. In fact, that an uncle took charge and sent him off to Cambridge, where he finally blossomed into the scholar we know today. So wait a second. He was being sent to Cambridge almost as a punishment, right? Because he wasn't doing well at the farm. So he was sent as what we would see, and perhaps he saw at that point in time, oh my gosh, I'm not doing a good job at this. I'm now being sent to school as a punishment. And look at that. Look what came from that. Michael Jordan missed more than 9,000 shots in his career, lost almost 300 games, 26 occasions. He had been entrusted to take the winning shot, but missed it. Failed over and over again in his life, and that's how he succeeded. Right? So these are just some stories, and I think a lot of times we, we look up to these famous people, and, and we forget that we have a lot, of a lot of these individuals in very similar stories, very sitting in the, in the chair next to us. Sometimes it's ourselves, because it doesn't have to be something crazy like becoming a well-famous physicist. Sometimes it's the small things that we deal with in our daily lives. 
So when we think about people, you know, that are very successful and, and people that have the ability to, to change lives and things like that, it doesn't take much. We all have that ability. Whether we consider ourselves successful materially or not, we all have something that we can contribute to each other, to society. So all of you can give. Whatever may be your social status, you have something you can share. Whatever God may have given you, you owe part of it to those who lack what is necessary. For if you were in their stead, you would be very happy if someone else were to share it with you. Your earthly treasures will be a little less, but your heavenly treasures will be more abundant. There, you'll reap a hundredfold what you have sown in good deeds on earth. So that's in the Gospel according to Spiritism, chapter 9. So when we think about, you know, the people that have a lot that they have to give, and the people who don't necessarily have all that much, even the little that we have to contribute will always be something more that somebody else can get. So because we don't have as much, doesn't mean that we don't have anything to contribute. Because what we have to contribute isn't necessarily money, isn't necessarily anything material, but a kind word, a shoulder to somebody who needs, right? A hug, a smile even, walking around giving, smiling to a stranger, sometimes is a lot more than anything else that they could have been given that day. When Jesus told the young men who had asked him about the means of inheriting eternal life, he said, get rid of all you have and follow me. He did not intend to establish an absolute principle that everyone must sell what they possess and that salvation can be obtained only at such a price. Rather, he meant to show that the attachment to earthly riches is an obstacle to salvation. So, it's important that we highlight this because we are not saying let go of every material thing you have, walk, you know, wear only, own only one piece of clothing. That, that's not what we're saying. We, we live in a material world. There, there are material necessities that we have here on earth. But what we are talking about is that attachment, that need for material things that then inhibit us from focusing on the things that truly matter. Your love for earthly possessions is one of the biggest obstacles to your moral and spiritual advancement. Through this attachment to, possess to possessions, you shatter your effective faculties, carrying them over to material things. So I'm sure all of us at some point in our lives have met the individuals who place their happiness and their success on material things. And what I mean by that is the people who say, well, I'm only going to be happy when I buy my house. They work hard, they buy their house, they live in it for a couple months, and then what happens? Buy else. Yep, that wasn't enough, right? At that point, it wasn't enough, we got to find something else. And then we say, well, you know, I have my house, but I, I don't think that that was enough. I need something else. So I know that I'm going to work hard. I'm looking forward to this position at work. And I know that when I get there, I'm going to be the happiest individual, individual on earth. And then you work hard. You get the position. You find out that there's even more responsibilities that you knew that you never knew you didn't want. And then you're not happy. Right? Because we are placing our happiness and we are placing our focus on things that could be easily taken away from us. We're placing that, that happiness and the care on things that one day could vanish, and then what? If you have love, you have everything there is to be desired on the earth. You possess the most excellent pearl that neither circumstances nor the evils of those who hate and persecute you will be able to take away. If you have love, you will have put your treasure where worms and rust cannot reach it, and you will see everything that might stain its purity erased from your soul. You will feel the weight of matter grow lighter day by day, and like a bird soaring in the sky with no memory of earth, you will ascend without ceasing. You will ascend forever until your exhilarated soul satiates itself with life in the bosom of the Lord. 
and I just love that 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 paragraph so much. It was in the in the Gospel according to Spiritism, chapter eight, which is called "Blessed are the pure of heart," because. Again, if, if we are letting go of those material things, we then have enough time to be able to focus on the things that truly matter, on the things that can't be taken away from us. The knowledge that we have, the love that we have for people, we may lose somebody that we love very much, but the love that we have for them, we don't lose that. That doesn't go away, right? The charity and the good deeds that we practice, Nobody can take that away from us. Nobody can take away the, the feeling of gratitude and being able to help somebody. That will always stay with us. So do not accumulate treasures on the earth where rust and worms corrupt them and where thieves unbury and steal them, but create treasures in heaven where neither rust nor worms corrupt for wherever your treasure is, there is your heart also. And that's in Matthew uh, 6.19. So not, not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that's counted truly counts. So what we mean by that, regardless of the amount of cars and houses that we own, our social rank, we can count all of that. But it doesn't necessarily mean that that's something that's truly worth it. It doesn't necessarily mean that's truly something that, that means anything, right? But I, I want to highlight the importance of, of understanding that we are here on a material world. And there are needs that we have. And it's not wrong to have goals, to have aspirations, right? To want a better job is not wrong. To, to, want, uh, to want a family, to have goals and aspirations, to have a better house because we want to provide something better for our kids, none of that is wrong. It is okay for us to have those goals and work towards them. What is not okay is to compromise our values, our characters, to to use other people to get to those goals, right? So when we think about kind of bridging a little bit between the natural laws and the material laws, we need to understand that it's perfectly fine to want to work hard and, and, and to try to get a promotion. You're doing some, we're doing something for ourselves, right? If we were to live on earth without any goals, without any aspirations, we would just be robots, right? We would have no, no reasoning, nothing to work towards. So just as our soul, right, as our spirit looks to evolve within the spiritual life, as humans on earth, we are also evolving in the, in the material world. But the important thing is to not lose sight of what matters. It is to not lose ourselves. It is not to, to, to hurt our health, to damage our bodies because we're working towards that promotion and that job because that's what we want. It's the reasoning of why we do things. Because if we filter it through the lens of are the things that I am doing to contribute to my eternal happiness, to the eternal happiness of my neighbor, Am I filtering it through, if I were to think, what would Jesus do, right? Or if I were to go even further and say, would I be happy if somebody did this to me? If we're filtering it through those lenses and we're not placing every value and every single happiness in a material thing, we are continuously evolving. So it is okay to have that thought. And I just want to highlight that because I think a lot of times, right, we have that thought of, well, I mean, I guess I'll keep my 30-year-old car because if I get a new car, then that means I'm placing every value on material things. No, it's okay. It's okay. But it's about whether we are placing more value on the material things or are we placing more values on who we are as individuals, as spirits, not as the person here on earth, but also with the understanding that the more we are given, 
the more we'll, we'll receive and will be asked of, right? So remember that the more we have, the more we work towards it, the more that it will be asked, the more responsibility we'll have. And it's important that we know what do we do with that responsibility. Do we take that responsibility, that high rank, to abuse the people below us, or do we take that rank to support those individuals along the way, right? Whether it be professionally, personally. So we all have a responsibility, and whether we have a lot of material knowledge or the knowledge of spiritism, we can each contribute a little bit. And we each have that responsibility. No matter how little we have to contribute, we still have that responsibility. So to end this off, there is a section in the Gospel According to Spiritism. It's in the chapter titled uh, Be Perfect uh, that I really like because it highlights a lot of these things and it summarizes it really nicely because if we're ever in doubt, we can kind of filter it through some of these lenses because it talks about spirits that are, that are working morally, right, towards their perfection, their involvement, as well as helping other people along the way. And so it says, for these individuals, they have faith in God and in God's goodness, justice, and wisdom. They know that nothing happens without God's permission, so they submit to the divine will in everything. They have faith in the future. Thus, they place spiritual possessions above temporal ones. They know that all of the vicissitudes of life, all its sorrows and all its disappointments, are trials or expiations, and they accept them without complaining. They find their satisfaction in the benefits they spread around, the service they render, the happiness they promote, the tears they dry, and the consolation they provide to the afflicted. Their first impulse is to think of others before thinking of themselves, and to attend to the interest of others before their own. The selfish, on the other hand, calculate the profits and losses entailed in every generous act. These people, these moral people, are kind, humane, and benevolent toward all, regardless of race or creed, because they regard all people as their brothers and sisters in Christ. They respect all sincere convictions that others might hold to, and they do not anathemize those who do not think like they do. They hold no hatred or rancor or desire for any vengeance. Following Jesus' example, they forgive and forget offenses and remember only good deeds because they know that they will be forgiven according to how they themselves have forgiven. They're indulgent towards others' weaknesses, for they know that they themselves need indulgence. And they recall the words of Christ, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Thank you. Thank you.